Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. If you do not have a Bible, please lift up your hand and one of our ushers will get to you. They're in the back. Anybody else? Just keep your hand up. Keep it up. Uh, Revelation chapter 2. We are not going to read the scripture for, for the sake of time. We're gonna, we'll jump into it when we get there. But Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Let's go ahead and find that and let's pray. Father, I ask you to guide us into all truth this morning. Father, so thankful that you make all things new. Praise you, Jesus, for that. Praise you, Lord Jesus. You've come to take our brokenness and make us new. And Father, I pray you would take control of my thoughts and my words right now. You would communicate, Lord, through this vessel exactly what you want to communicate. Father, we just give you uh, this time. I, I pray against any distractions or disruptions. Give us listening ears. Give us, give us tender hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said together, amen. amen. We are in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is apocalypse. Apocalypse means an unveiling or, or taking that can, uh, the top, if you will, off the soup, looking into it, and God is saying, this is what the future holds for the world. The revelation, the unveiling. There is a... Uh, uh, outline in verse 19 of chapter 1. And I want us to see this, so pay, pay attention to this one. This is real easy. So it says in verse 19, write the things, Jesus is speaking to John, write the things which you have seen. And John does that, that's chapter 1. Write the things which are. And that's chapters 2 and 3, that's the church age, and the things which will take place after this. So Jesus gives this outline, the things which you have seen, Write it down. The things which are the present age, present age and then the things will take, take place after this. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. Because after chapter 3, Jesus, uh, uh, in chapter 3, he ends the address to the church. And then when you look in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, After these things I looked. After what things? The things which are the present age, the church age. Behold, I looked, behold, a door standing open in heaven, and a voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking to me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. See, there, there's the third part of the outline. Now, notice what happens here. There's a voice from heaven that sounds like a what, church? Trumpet. And then there's a door open in chapter 4, verse 1. And any Jew would understand that that is Rosh Hashanah. That's the ingathering of the righteous. What was the ingathering of the righteous? It was something that when they started Rosh Hashanah, it was a festival where the priest, the high priest, would come out to the temple door. They would open the door up to the outer gate of the temple, and someone would blow a guess what? A trumpet or a shofar. Whoop, whoop. The people would come up to the temple. The high priest would be standing there and they would just gather together, but they would not go into the temple. This is called the ingathering of the righteous. This is a foreshadowing of the ingathering of the righteous, what we call or what Paul called the snatching way of the church in Thessalonians. When there's a trumpet from heaven, and we will meet Jesus in the air, in the clouds, and forever be with him. So that's the ingathering of the righteous. So it's all in the scriptures. But in chapter 4, verse 1, we see that transition. It goes from the church age now to the future of the earth. And John is taken up into heaven. And now he sees heavenly things and he's looking down upon the earth. So this, the church age is done. But you may ask the question, okay, but after chapter 4, there are saints being martyred. There are saints on earth. Where's the church? There are saints on earth, I believe, from Scripture, because there are people coming to Christ after the rapture. Even during the seven-year tribulation, which we're going to disseminate for you over the next couple of months, there are people coming to Christ, and they're, they're being martyred by the Antichrist. So that transition is there. So that is the outline. But we are in the church age. That's where we are right now. And we're looking in chapter uh, 2, verse 18, where Jesus is addressing 
particular churches. Now, each church, except for two, has a correction. Okay? So Jesus is addressing particular things in those churches, and he's expecting a response out of five of the churches. They need to repent. So I got a question for us. Do you think, what if Jesus were to write a, a letter to the church in Troy? First of all, have you ever thought maybe what he would say? What would he say to the church in Troy? What would he say to the congregation of Calvary Chapel? See, as a Christian, I'm very interested in that. And as someone who's an overseer, I'm very interested in the state, the health of Calvary Chapel. And so I want to be always open to the correction of the Lord. I always want to be open to make sure that, that I'm listening to him, that my life is following him, that I'm being obedient, but that also we're making disciples here. So I'm, I'm just, I, I think about that. I think, okay, so Lord, what, what would you say to us? Now, I don't know exactly what he would say to us, but what we can do is go through scripture, and if we have a listening ear, He'll speak to us. Amen. He can speak to the congregation. He speaks to individual hearts. So he says here in verse 18, he says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Now notice he says they are eyes like flame of fire. So not literally flames coming out of his eyes. But he says the feet are like fine brass. Now, this symbolism is very easy to interpret. When you have fire coming out of the eyes, what it is literally saying is, watch this, Jesus can see everything about you and me, every layer in our life, and he can see everything about the, the congregation that he's addressing. What he sees is absolutely the truth. And I don't know about you, but I found that sometimes I'm a I can be a little complicated. I can be a little layered. And as, as uh, Amber was sharing with us, you know how the Lord allowed this thing to happen in her life. Oh my gosh, I didn't know that story until first service. I couldn't imagine some, anything worse than being falsely accused of abusing a child. Can you think of anything worse? No, and, and, but what God did is he said, now watch what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to take this, watch this, and this is what he does with all of us. I'm going to take this person, you and me and Amber, I'm going to take her from independence to dependence upon me. Did you catch that? I'm going to take her from independence. I'm going to handle this. I've got this. I'm in control too. I'm going to allow a situation in her life and he'll allow these situations in our lives where we don't have control and we know we don't have control. And then the only thing we can do is say, God, I need you. I need you. That is not a bad place to be. That's exactly what the Lord wants us. And if he has to allow those tests and trials in our lives to accomplish that, then I say, okay, Lord, then I'm going to trust you. And if you watch maturing Christians, and I've, I've had the privilege of, of, of watching mature, just seasoned believers that have been through so much, there is such a trust in the Lord. There's such a dependence upon the Lord not an independence. So the Lord will allow those things to happen, but he can see all of those things in our lives, all of those things because his eyes, and then his feet are like brass, and what that, that brass represents judgment, righteous judgment. So he sees everything, and he's judging righteously. Now, let me say this. God knows things about you that you don't even know about yourself because he has eyes like, he can, he can see everything, and yet he still loves you. It's just amazing. It's amazing. He sees things in our hearts that we can't see, He has, and he judges righteously, and yet he still loves us. And here is the most amazing thing, is that he as he sees and he judges righteously, none of us on our own would pass his judgment. 
None of us on our own would make it into heaven. If we were on our own, the doors of heaven would be closed for eternity. Thus, the cross. This is why the cross is so is so beautiful. It's so amazing. It's so I don't I can't get an adjective out. It's so sublime. That doesn't even work. It's so beautiful. Yeah, that's close, but it's so yeah, I, there's just no word because it sees my sin, but it takes my sin and washes me and makes me sanctified and makes me holy. The one who can see everything about Wes's life, he judges righteously, but because of Jesus, he declares me holy. It doesn't get any better than that. So he says, the things, these things says the Son of God, the flame of fire, eyes like a flame of fire. So when Jesus speaks, folks, and he's about to speak to this Thyatira church, he is going to judge righteously. By the way, the theme this morning of Thyatira is God is not politically correct. He's just correct. Now, the reason why I say that is because you're going to see something happen in the church of Thyatira that there's going to be a teacher that's going to pop up here that's going to teach things that we would call politically correct today and that Jesus rebukes her rebukes them for okay but let's get to God's word here when we when we're dealing with God's word watch this when we respond to God's word if it's a command a command that applies to us generally speaking we're to obey it for example he says here in 1 John 3 23 and this is the commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another if you want to know what Jesus's commandments are want to get into commandments what commands believe in Jesus? Okay, I got that. I believe he died and he resurrected from the dead for my sin. I accept that. I receive that. But then also love one another. That's his command. He says, listen, these are non-negotiables. Love each other. And you grow. We grow in God's kingdom when we love one another. The second command he gives us, Ephesians 4.32, he says, And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Listen, we do not grow as Christians by being offended by another Christian and going, Oh, fine, I'm going to go find another church. Listen, or the, the pastor said something from the pulpit that I just, I just don't think was... Right, or I mean, if it's not biblical, that's something completely different. But they just, I, they offended me. I just didn't like them. I tell you what, that's when the growth happens. Not when you split and find a, a place that's going to just, I don't know. I don't, is, are there any perfect churches? I don't think so. If there is, you better leave it because you'll ruin it. Just, just saying. But, but we are to love one another. So here, watch this. So here's the deal, is that we are to forgive one another. So I, I am offended by something you do, that the idea is we're to come together in fellowship, we're to talk it out, and we're to, offer, we're to apologize and ask for forgiveness. And then love and fellowship happens. You don't run the other way. Does that make sense, church? That's where real fellowship in the Spirit happens. When you're offended by someone, someone hurts you, and you offer your apology if you've done it, and you sincerely mean it, and you forgive that person. That's where real fellowship... But a lot of people don't want to go there. They're not obeying God's commandment. We want to obey God's command. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, second thing concerning God's Word is that if there's a promise, believe it as if your life depended on it. If God has puts out a promise, a truth out there. Now, we use the word promise, but it's just a truth statement. Believe it as if your life depended on it. Ephesians, this is, a, this is a premier verse. You all know this verse. It says, For by grace you have been, past tense, saved. Through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. You have been saved. Now, listen, some people... Here, still question, I wonder if I'm really saved. Listen, if God makes a promise in His Word, a truth statement in His Word, believe it. It's true. And this can save you a whole lot of, of angst in your walk with the Lord. 
Another one, Philippians 1, 6. This is an amazing verse. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God started his work. He's working in you, in me, and through me. It's his work. He's doing it. And he said, I started it and I'll complete it. So you know in my Christian walk what I can do? Watch this. I can relax. I'm just like, okay, Lord. I want, I want to obey. I want to believe on you. I want to follow you. I want to love my brothers. And, and, I, want to, I, want to, I, and, and I know you've started this work in me. I know you started this work. Make sense, church? Okay, move on to the third one, and that is, if there is a correction, ask, does it apply to my life? That's what we want to do. You know what the tendency is to do? And I think Satan is a master at doing this. When you hear a correction from God's word, you go, oh, I wish so-and-so was here. I've heard this so many times at the back door. Oh, my Fill in the blank. Husband needs to hear that. Or my wife needs to hear that. Or my child needs to hear that. And oftentimes, a voice in my head goes, well, honey, did you hear it? Ah, I'm kidding. I'm joking. Here, watch this. Have you left your first love? Now, watch this. Have you left your first love? That was a first correction of the church at Ephesus. Have I, le have I left my first love? Is Jesus really premier in my life? If he's not, then I need to ask him to, to, to show me how to repent of those things, go back to the first works like in, in Ephesus they told them to do. Lord, does it apply to me? Second point is that do you tolerate false teaching? That was one of the corrections that Jesus had for the churches. They were tolerating false teachers. It's going to be the same thing with Thyatira. Here in just a moment, you're going to see it. And then finally here, are you more interested in being politically correct rather than God correct? Or... Would you rather offend God or man? And that's really what's going to be happening. You're going to see this. In Thyatira, watch. After verse 19, after he tells them, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. This uh, verse 19 is something, is the, one of the biggest compliments, the biggest encouragement you could give to any church. I know your works, your love, your service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. In other words, in other words you guys are going in the right direction. This is something I want to see, in, not in Calvary Chapel, but all churches in Troy and Lincoln County. Working, serving in love and in faith. And the works that you were doing a while ago, you're doing even better now. May I say this? This is what I see happening. Now, I'm not the final judge on all this. Jesus is. We know that, right? I don't see everything. But when I look at you guys, I see the works becoming greater and greater. And I'm just like, go, God, go. This is awesome. There's other ministries that are going to be popping up in Lincoln County. I'm kind of like, you know, I was telling the first service, when my feet leave this earth, and, and I want Lincoln County to be totally, radically influenced by the gospel, mercy, and love of Jesus Christ. I just want that to, and you know what? It's happening. It's happening. We, we, we talked about this before, but that, that KMOV, was it KMOV? Who did the TV thing? Fox News, and, and I had like six interviews and of people, no, noted people around our city, and five of them were Christians. Yeah, yeah. Next year, let's make it six. But that's the way it should be, infiltrating and, and spreading God's word. Am I in the right church? This is awesome. You guys are awesome. And I think that's what's happening. We want to keep going in that direction. Amen. Humbly going in that direction. But now watch this. Verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Uh-oh. Pay attention. You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Okay. So there's a teaching getting into the church by 
this Jezebel type of woman. It wasn't actually Jezebel. What did Jezebel do in the Old Testament? She, she couldn't stand, watch this, she couldn't stand God's word. She couldn't stand God's standards. She couldn't stand the way God created things. And she, when someone stood up to preach the truth, she killed them. She killed them. And that led to sexual immorality. And that's exactly what's going on today in the church. We are diluting the gospel. We are taking things. But let me preface it by building up this point. We were created. When you look at our, our when you, uh, some of you had a donut in between services. Okay, so let me tell you what happened. When you took that bite of the donut, there are these salivary glands in your, in your mouth that squirted out. This is kind of gross. And you're going. The process has already started. You're digesting that. Then you're a so you swallow and your esophagus goes. It's a muscle. It goes. It contracts. It goes down into your stomach over here, and your stomach is full of these acids that begin to break down that donut into smaller molecules. Then it goes into the large intestine, and then and then the the body does its best to pull the nutrients from that donut. It's kind of like, what is this? But it begins to pull the carbohydrates and the, sh the sugars get almost immediately digested. But then, then it goes to the, 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 the colon, large, then it goes down and it gets eliminated. So all the bad stuff then gets eliminated. But God created this incredible mechanism for you to take nutrients from food when you're about to take a breath. Think about this. In with the good air, out with the, your body, your lungs take that oxygen into these little fingers in, in, in your, and cap, I don't know what they are, in your lungs, and it converts it to oxygen. Your red blood cells come up, they pick up the oxygen. This is crazy. And then goes to your muscle, goes to your brain so you can function. If you stop breathing, it all begins to shut down. In fact, I learned this from a chiropractor. Fascinating mechanism, the way you've been created. If you're ever, anybody ever have cramps? Cr I hate cramps. I mean, I can be the cramp king. I get them on my foot, and my foot goes, Aah! I'm like, what are you doing? Stop it. It's like, ah, watch this. Ah, but ah! Okay, so watch this. Here's what my chiropractor taught me. He said, hold your breath for 20 seconds. Because like, I was having back spasms. I was going, I had a real bad back injury. And he said, hold your breath for 20, and I was holding my breath for 20 seconds. And at about 25 seconds, the spasm on my back went like this. Whew. It just relaxed. And he said, what happens is your brain redirects those red blood cells to your vital organs because it realizes it's not taking in oxygen. So it takes it away from the large muscle groups. Hey, you were created. Are you with me? Listen, you can't, there's no computer programmer that's going to program that except God himself. Then you have a nervous system. You have nerves. You have nerves. Imagine if you didn't have nerves. You know, I was, I was making some coffee the other day, and um, I guess Sharice had already used the Pyrex, and put the Pyrex in it for, for three minutes, and I reached in to grab it and burned. I mean, it burned burned. I got a blister. I grabbed it and immediately I went, ah, like that. And I'll imagine if I didn't have that nervous system, that nervous system to, to kick in. And then there's, there's, I don't know what they call them. I, I don't know enough about this stuff, but they, they have the, um, they have a nervous system where you control, but then you have the other nervous system where you don't control, like you're breathing. You don't sit there and think, I got to breathe. You know, it just, and then when you start running, you don't sit there and go, oh, I got to, <laughs> you know, it automatically begins to happen. And then you have this, which I've learned several times, you have this response. I think it's, vas I'm going to pronounce this wrong, vasovagal response, Therese, is that right? Vasovagal response where it's your, if something happens, I got to, to tell you what happened. I got this IV put into me and the IV was bent and they didn't know it and they couldn't figure it out. 
and but I knew something was wrong. And I'm sitting there and I was laying down and all of a sudden I was drenched with sweat and my blood pressure went down to like 80 over 40, something gross like that. I got, got nauseous, and my Sharice was like, he's having a vasovagal response. And I'm like, vaso, whatever it is, just get it the response, get it to go away. And, and she, that's your central nervous system responding to a stimuli that I wasn't even in control. You were created. You were also created male and female. God created male and female. And it is absolutely amazing over the last 20 years how this insane turn the world has made to where now people are saying, well, you really shouldn't call your children little boy or little girl until they figure out what they are. Listen, listen, I had four and five-year-old little boys that couldn't put their shoes on the right feet. I'm not going to leave it up to them to identify what, what gender they are. I'm going to tell them, you're a boy. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute. There are people who struggle with that. Okay, that's fine. That's fine, but you're not doing anyone any favors by leaving it up to a child to guess what sex, the gender they are. That's insanity. Now, that's a comment about the world. I'm talking about the church now. So how should the church respond to it? How should the, what about same-sex attraction? That's a very real issue, and it's in the church. What if someone's struggling with those things? How should we respond? Listen, if you come to me, and I'm a pastor, and you say, man, I'm struggling with this stuff, let me tell you what's going to happen the nanosecond after you share your struggle. Oh, you're going to get hugged. You're going to get prayed for. You're going to get loved, and I'll be happy to sit down with you, and we'll talk through this stuff. But what was happening in the church was this woman was coming in and saying, oh, it's all a free-for-all. You guys can do whatever you want. After all, that's just the way we were made. And sexual immorality became rampant. And Jesus says, you know, don't put up with it. It's, that's in the church. And we see here what Paul actually addresses Corinth because there was, in Corinth, it was incredibly sex-saturated. They had this temple that actually you'd go and worship and you'd sleep with temple prostitutes. And so when that began to happen, then a lot of gay, gay lifestyle began to happen. So they, were, they had men who were prostitutes and boys who were prostitutes for men. It just got absolutely insane. And here's what Paul says to this culture. Um, to the church, rather. He says, do, not, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. So here's this comment. The first thing he says is, listen, don't be deceived about this. Don't be so obviously there was some deception going on. Don't be deceived. Watch what he says. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, that word fornicator means male prostitute, nor idolaters, those are the ones who bow down and worship idols, nor adulterers. You know what adultery is, men who are going or women are going outside their marriage and, and just having sex, just, just, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, that sounds so, so politically incorrect. It sounds so intolerant. Listen. God is not politically correct. He's just correct. And he wouldn't be God unless he told us the truth. Amen? Do you want, if you don't want the truth, Jesus says, that's okay. Keep moving along. I'm here to declare the truth to you. Now, again, what should the church's response be to this? In the culture, watch. In the culture, as far as a culture goes, me as quote-unquote conservative person, I'm going to vote against this LGBTQ agenda. That's how I vote. Now, the reason why I vote that way is because I can see it's going to deteriorate our society. But what about the church? As a Christian, here's how I see things. There are two kingdoms in this world. There's a kingdom of this world that's ruled by a fallen angel, Satan, Lucifer, and then there's a kingdom of God. I want all the people, no matter what their sin might be, 
out of the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God. That's the goal. That's it. Get them into the kingdom of God. Let God clean them up. Let God wash them. Let God regenerate them. And we will patiently walk with them through it. Amen? That's it. There's no hate. There's no intolerance. Well, I hate that word intolerance. What does that even mean? You know, I'm intolerant of drinking turpentine. Am I a to- intolerant person? I'm, in- I'm intolerant of people who abuse children. Am I intolerant? I'm intolerant of, of pedophiles being released into the community. And I'm into- Is that intolerance? I'm sorry. Then I'm intolerant. We're intolerant of a lot of things. So I don't even know what that intolerance means. So, here's what he says. So were some of you. So are some of you. Some of you came out of that background. This is what the church is made of. He says, but watch, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So what he's clearly saying is, there's some of you guys in Corinth, you were former male prostitutes. You, you were prostitutes in the temple. You were, you were gay. You were homo- having homosexual sex. You guys and thieves and then covetous and drunkards. and all, That was you, but now you've been washed. You've been cleansed. It does not mean you don't still struggle with it. See, that's the difference. It doesn't mean you're still not tempted by that. But what Paul is clearly saying is, you've been washed. You've been redeemed. You've been declared holy. That's your new identity. That's who I say you are, and that's a reality. And now, now listen, Christians, here's where the rubber hits the road. When you grow in the knowledge of who you are in Christ, when you grow in your identity in Christ, you're going to have an enemy come back against you and try to tempt you back into this, that stuff. Plus, your flesh might rise up and tempt you back into this, in that stuff. That doesn't mean you're not washed and you're not sanctified. That was the whole point that Paul was making. And later on, he says, you know, when you're in Christ, you're a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. So (laughs) when we had this beautiful testimony this morning, did you guys hear it all? Did you hear what Amber was saying? She was saved. She belonged to Jesus Christ. Then this this test came into her life, and watch this, it brought out a whole lot of ugly. Oh, I got news for you. God's in the business of taking ugly and making it new. That's what he does. That's what he does. And she she made the comment that that um, you know, not all of us are broken and all I'm I'm sitting there going, I think she said that. Maybe I misheard it. I'm thinking, no, 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 we all are. We all are. But this is, this is the response that we should have. So in the church of Jesus Christ, what Jesus is saying is that teaching brought into the church is so wrong. It's just wrong. And then he, he warns her. He says, verse 20, 21, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed. Uh, with those who commit adultery. In other words, Jesus is clearly saying when you when you cross that line of sexual immorality, folks, your attention up here, please, there you're opening yourself up to all kinds of diseases. And we're seeing that today. There was this, um, years ago, maybe some of you remember, there was an inter- international entomology report about HIV. And it was a really fascinating study because here was the conclusion of it. The conclusion was an active gay male lives 20 years, has a lifespan 20 years less than anyone else, any other male. And I thought, that's really interesting. Had anybody ever heard that? 20 years, so an active gay male lives, lifespan is 20 years less. They die at an average of age 50 than an average man who lives to be 74 years. I thought that was really interesting. 
because that got that report got buried. And my point is not, I'm not sitting there looking down my nose if you're struggling with same-sex attraction. That's not my point. My point is that Jesus said, I'll throw her on her sickbed. Because when you go outside of God's design, how many of you guys know you open yourself up to all kinds of unnatural things? That's just simply what God is saying. And then he goes on and he says, I will kill her children with death. He's not literal children. He's talking those who, who, about those who, who um, follow the teaching. And then he goes on, verse 24, Now I say to you and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast that you have uh, hold fast what you have till I come. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him, I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He shall be dashed, they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Folks, Here's the deal. God does not want, nor is he ever going to get, perfect people. He wants authentic people, transparent people. Because, listen, if we're struggling with this sort of thing, we need to get into understand God's word, and he's given us power over this sin, and he has eyes like fire. Watch this. He has eyes like fire that maybe if you're struggling with something, he can see that, and he wants to burn that away in your life by showing you who you are in Christ. But as followers after Jesus Christ, in our community, in our world, we are to be loving, respectful, but you don't ever back down from the truth. You don't ever back down. So we have that choice. Am I going to be politically correct or God correct? Am I going to stand up for what's true or not? Am I going to fear men more than I fear God? Now, I say this in closing. The world, the way Satan has set things up, is he is going to try to put you in a corner. Put you in a corner. Oh, you're one of those phobic people. Don't go into that corner. That's a false premise. You're Islamophobic. No, I'm not really Islamophobic at all. Oh, but you, you're a homophobic. No, really, gay people don't scare me one bit. They don't scare me one bit. But let me tell you the truth about who Jesus Christ is. He's come to die for the sins of the world. He came to die for your sin. Or oh, are you saying my sin is wrong? No, let me tell you what Jesus has done. He's come to die for the sin of the world. And he's come to, 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 to redeem us back to him, to create in us a clean heart, to make us new creation. Or oh, are you saying that? No, you know what? Let me tell you what Jesus did. He came to come save sinners. See, because here's the thing. I'm not going to get in an argument with someone about their pet sin. I'm just going to point him to Jesus. You need him. You need to be in his kingdom. Amen. Let's stand for a word of prayer.